Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I will turn the mic over to James Butler for the welcome. James? Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar on creating peer networks and increasing social capital. I'm hosted by our office, the Office of Family Assistance. Um, we have a panel of expert presenters to discuss this critical topic with you today. Um, social capital, as you know, refers to the resources and support that people can access simply by virtue of their networks through family, friends, neighbors, teachers, colleagues, their social services staff, and other organizations. Greater social capital is generally associated with greater mobility and well-being as you gain access to information, support, and reinforcement of positive norms. It has also been associated with having greater resilience and the capacity to adapt positively to risk or adversity. Research has shown that organizations can be a source for helping individuals build social capital through opportunities for peer networking and assuming leadership roles which may increase motivation to persist in achieving higher education and employment goals. For today's webinar, our presenters will share how they support TANA participants in developing social capital and how they can expand their peer networks as they work to attain family self-sufficiency. Through this webinar, uh, it's our hope that you will hear tips to explore how increasing social capital can support the resilience and attainment of education and employment goals for low-wage parents, consider approaches to facilitating new peer networks created in the context of employment and education goals, as we hear about specific examples from our presenters, and reflect on how peer networks could be incorporated into your own TANF programs. We are delighted to have three dynamic presenters who will be guiding our conversation today. We will first hear from Dr. Mariana Chilton, who is a professor of public health at Drexel University and the director of the Center for Hunger-Free Communities. She currently serves as principal investigator of the Building Wealth and Health Network. Next, we will hear from Aaron Olikin, who serves as director of the Reach Up TANF program at the Vermont Department of Children and Families. In this role, she has focused her attention on developing training for staff and reinforcing a culture of compassion, understanding, and best practice. She believes that creating safe and productive ways for participants to build connections, resiliency, and support is an area in which TANF programs can innovate and grow. Finally, we will hear from Christine Smith, who serves as the Health Equity and Tribal Grant Supervisor at the Minnesota Department of Health. Prior to joining the Minnesota Department of Health, she served in several job capacities at Minnesota's Family Investment Program. She's also, okay. I found this on the web. For research, she's the also a certified a adverse childhood experience trainer with a focus on historical trauma and cultural resiliency. Throughout the presentation, you will have an opportunity to ask questions through the chat box in the bottom left corner of your screen. We encourage you to ask questions. And if your question is for a specific presenter or program, please be sure to specify that. Uh, if we don't get any, everyone's questions answered, um, we will provide a Q&A that will appear on the PRTA website, along with a transcript and audio recording of today's webinar. During the webinar, there will also be a series of polling questions um, that will appear on your screen. You can respond to those by clicking on the radio button next to your selected response. Doing so not only helps guide the conversation, but will also share additional information that may inform your practice. So you will see the first polling question come before you. Um, and I think, Steve, you're going to do the polling question for us. Yes. So as James mentioned, we hope to create an interactive webinar for you and wanted to get your feedback on a few questions. The first question is how familiar are you with the concepts of trauma, 
trauma-informed practice, and adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs. And your choices are very familiar, somewhat familiar, or not familiar. So we'll open that poll and give you the opportunity to weigh in directly on your screen, and then we will share the results. All right, so it looks like the majority of you are somewhat familiar, uh, but this seems to be a good mix, so this should be an interesting presentation for all of you, hopefully. Now, we'll move forward with the first presentation by Mariana Chutz. Hello, everyone. This is Mariana Chilton coming to you from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And first, I just wanted to start out and thank the Agency for Children and Families for inviting me and, of course, um, all of the people that helped to support this program to be able to present to you today our program called the Building Wealth and Health Network. We're operating in Philadelphia, and we have been partnering with the State of Pennsylvania Income Maintenance Program, and we've been working with them since 2013 to build up this program, um, and it's focused on trauma-informed peer support and financial empowerment. And this is built within the TANF program. We got started in 2014 uh, with a pilot and a proof of concept, and then I'll tell you a little bit about some what it is now, how, uh, how we have started to flourish, and that's really thanks to our incredible network of members who are in the Building Wealth and Health Network. So if you could click to the next slide, I'll give you a quick overview. Um, so quick all the way through to the end of the, thank you so much. So we'll, I'll just give a quick overview on TANF health and um, work, the relationship between work and health, and just make sure that we're all on the same page. There's a lot of us that do group type of work, and we may call it peer support or social building, social capital, um, and also make sure that we have our definition straight. And then I'll just do a quick introduction to different forms of trauma and what is trauma-informed practice. I recognize that most people on the call are familiar or very familiar, um, but want to make sure that everybody's uh, on the same page. And then I'll talk about the Building Wealth and Health Network, uh, describe the benefits of the program, and give everybody on the call just some quick tips. You don't have to necessarily adopt the Building Wealth and Health Network, but there are some tricks that we've got in our back pocket that we're happy to share with you. So if you can click to the next slide. And just click all the way through. There you go. Thank you. So um, I think we all know that um, the work participation requirement in a variety of our states has very mixed success. Um, and I think that the biggest thing that at least that we're concerned about in the state of Pennsylvania is that people enter into TANF and then may do well, start to get it and get a job, but then may quickly actually get off the program and may, may be okay for a while and then they have to return to TANF. So we recognize that as churning on and off of TANF. And what we want to do is help people to build self-sufficiency so they don't have to return to the program. We all know that there's a lot of barriers to work. Uh, about one third of people on TANF have a work limiting health condition. Many have disabilities. And also, um, although it's not measured all across the board, across the country, we know that in many different programs that have begun to measure it, that there is a very high rate of intimate partner violence among the particip participants in TANF and also high involvement with the criminal justice system. Click ahead. Click one more time. So I think what's important to us and something that we've learned, if you could click back to the uh, photograph, it would be great. Thank you. What's important to us is the power of the group. What we recognize is that when a group of people gets together, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Um, these are some of the members of the Building Wealth and Health Network, and they're pictured here with our two coaches, Kevin and Allie. And it really is quite true is that the resilience um, and brilliance of an individual gets magnified once 
um, a, an individual enters into a group. And I'll tell you how that happens with the Building Wealth and Health Network. But before we do that, I wanna make sure we're on the same page with uh, concepts of peer support. So you can click to the next slide and click all the way through. Thank you. So um, what, how we define a peer network in, on the, in, in our program, which we call the network for short, is it's a group of people who have shared experiences where they can tap into and stimulate the resilience in each other. All of us have resilience, but once you get together in a group, you can start to recognize the resilience in each other, and then that resilience can be built um, together. So we focus our program with peer support. What is peer support? It's when people who have common experiences can offer support to others in a variety of ways. So um, ways that can help to stimulate personal growth, recovery, or well-being. That different kind of support can be instrumental. Uh, so for instance, um, you know, helping someone to get a ride somewhere or giving them directions. It could be emotional. In other words, providing encouragement, um, care and concern. It could be informational. In other words, I know there's a diaper bank and it's open on this particular day if you need diapers. And affiliative support. Say, oh, I have a friend who knows that there's a job there those kinds of things. So that type of peer support is very powerful and it tends to naturally happen when you get a group of people together. Social support um, is another fancy term for just meeting family and friends and peers that provide different kinds of support, sort of similar support as the peer support. And then social capital is the fancy term that a lot of researchers use. And that's it's really meaning about the assets or resources that can be harnessed through bonds, bridges, and linkages. And by bonds, that means people who have a shared identity. That could be close friends or your inner circle. Bridges is getting beyond those who have a shared identi identity with you. They could be um, friends or colleagues or associates. And then linkages is really important as well in social capital. Linkages are the kinds of bonds that can form between people of different um, backgrounds, socioeconomic backgrounds. So they can be linkages across class, um, race and ethnicity, professional expertise, wealth, etc. So social capital is really being able to tap into a variety of assets in a normal in a, in a variety of different social experiences. Okay, let's click ahead. So in terms of uh, trauma, because our, our focus is on trauma-informed peer support, I felt it was necessary to get in a little bit into trauma. There are two ways of thinking about trauma across the lifespan. For young children, kids who experience trauma, we call it toxic stress. And we know that it, uh, it's an overwhelming, a relentless type of stress that young children experience when they don't have enough support to overcome it. It can be actually quite chronic in, the term, in terms of homelessness. It's not like a one-time type of thing. You can be homeless for months at a time and that can actually really sear itself into the brain it affects brain growth, cognitive, social, and emotional development. And um, adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, are often referred to as in, in, in this umbrella type of term of toxic stress. I'll get to ACEs in a second. So adverse childhood experiences is ACEs. Traumatic stress uh, for adults, of course, is internal and external fact factors that are in, where you don't have enough um, inside to really cope with an external threat. It affects the nervous system where people become so overwhelmed and then there's this sense of helplessness of not being able to, um, to move or to think of a future or to make decisions. There's all a variety of types of helplessness um, and that can be related to toxic stress. So the next slide, please, will show you um, what we really mean by what, what we see in terms of those of us who work on trauma, we recognize that there are multiple layers to trauma. So a lot of people who are not familiar with trauma theory may think, oh, okay, this person has a lot of behavioral challenges or emotional dysregulation, something's wrong with them. Or why is it that they can't get stable financially? Why didn't they stay in school or even a physical illness as well? Those are the things that we can see and that people tend to judge. But those of us who work on trauma recognize that that's just the tip of the iceberg. What's underneath the iceberg that's driving those behavioral challenges or that emotional dysregulation. And that could be experiences with trauma or loss. Um, of course, when someone has experienced trauma, they have chronic hyperarousal or inflammation in the body. Adverse childhood experiences, which can be exposure during childhood to abuse or neglect, sexual abuse, 
in terms of emotions or physical type of abuse, but also having a parent who is incarcerated, um, witnessing domestic violence, witnessing your mother or stepmother being um, hit or punched, um, and or having someone in the family with severe mental illness or who has attempted suicide. So that's the composite type of experiences called adverse childhood experiences. Also family and social dysfunction, but it's important to also recognize the historical trauma over the generations of slavery and genocide that we have in our country that affects us um, very much today. That type of violence and trauma has been carried carried with us um, into today. And we won't get into the deets of that, but I think you all can, um, can relate. So if you can click to the next slide, just to give you a little bit of background on what is trauma-informed practice, it realizes the widespread impact of trauma and it recognizes that there are paths to recovery, recognizing signs and symptoms of trauma in our clients and families, even in our own staff, and in the way that we run our organizations or our systems, we might recognize how trauma is carried through that. It's also making sure that a trauma-informed practice can respond, integrating the knowledge about trauma into our policies and our procedures and practice, and where we actively resist re-traumatizing people who are coming to us for services. Um, if you want to learn more about that, you can go to SAMHSA or, of course, the OFA Peer TA Network. Um, and we built our peer support program off of the sanctuary model, which was developed by Dr. Sandra Bloom. If you look it up online, you can find a new, you can find multiple books that Sandy has written about how our systems can traumatize and re-traumatize and how to build our organizations and our programs in a way that are trauma informed. So if you can click again, now we can get into the Building Wealth and Health Network. So if you can uh, click all the way through to the, where you can see the full Lotus. Okay, so what I'm gonna talk to you mostly about today is our group classes and our peer support. It consists of 16 sessions of financial self-empowerment. I'll be describing that to you today. We also create, help people to open up savings accounts where we match their savings up to $20 per month. And we carry that on for 12 months. So if a person, once we help them open their account, if they put in a dollar in the month, we match it with a dollar. We add from our own grant money. Um, in the same way, if they put in up to $20 a month, we will match that as well. It's the idea of helping people to build their assets and to develop a sense of future with a tangible embodiment in terms of financial, trying to build up financial wealth. We also provide social work referral and financial coaching, and also a really integral component to our the way that we help to build social capital is that we have a network member advisory board. These are members who of our program who have graduated who come back to us quarterly and also have a, uh, a group of subcommittees where they advise us on how to improve our programming, how to spread the word about our program, um, and help us to think about how we can actually expand our program, not only across the city and across the state, but to other states across the country. Okay, so you can click, click again. Um, click all the way through to the where it says money. There you go. So what is the Financial Self-Empowerment Program? Remember, it consists of trauma-informed peer support, and we use the language of self that deals with safety, emotions or emotional management, loss and letting go, and developing a sense of future. Many times when uh, those who work with people who've experienced a lot of trauma recognize that there's a lot of loss that happens, unaddressed grief. So it's important to learn how to recognize the losses there. And also, how do you develop a sense of future People who've experienced trauma have a really hard time sometimes of creating individual goals and being able to stick to them uh, or even thinking that they have a future. Back to that savings account, you'd recognize that that's actually a future oriented type of experience and it's experiential uh, where people can start to invest in their future. That's where the financial empowerment comes in. We help people to learn how to manage their money, what it might mean to own a business. Many of you know that a lot of people who are on cash welfare also may have um, other ways of bringing in income, doing a little side business or a side hustle, doing hair and nails. Um, and there's very entrepreneurship, we're very entrepreneurial. We're trying to help people recognize that they can be a CEO, they can own a business. We help them learn how to negotiate good wages, of course, earn money and build up their credit, and of course, yield the benefits. And these are some members in our, um, on our advisory board helping us with the various components of our program. Click ahead. In terms of the match savings, 
um, click all the way through. Again, it's a one-to-one -one match. We work with a credit union. We have the bankers who come to us on site and we also take uh, make a visit to the bank. There's a lot of distrust in the banking industry and banks in general. And so we have to make sure that there's personal face-to-face -face interaction to make sure that the savings, the savings goals can actually be realized and help people to learn how to save money and to be able to start trusting the system. There we are on a, on a bank visit. Click again. So this is an example of some of our class topics. Again, there are 16 classes. And I can just talk to you about the first one. What's your, where we help people work on their financial and personal reputation. So that has a lot to do about how do you read a credit report? How do you pull down your credit? How do you read it? And then of course, how can you start to improve it? Which we talk about it as a form of reputation. And also how can you control the image that people have of you and your own personal reputation? That's where the language of self comes back in. Another one is, um, managing work and communication or creating your future, entrepreneurship and creativity. So it's this idea of helping people to build up their self-confidence um, in order to become an entrepreneur and also teaching them the basics of starting a business. And you would be amazed that once you get people start talking about some of their, uh, their dreams and hopes for their own businesses and being able to develop a sense of future and build up their wealth, the type of sharing that goes along in the group is actually quite, it's priceless. It's quite amazing. Click again. I'll give you a sense of the different types of, um, I think you click two more pictures come up. Thank you. So at the beginning of each session, the group goes over their own group goals, which they develop together as a group and also kind of revisit their own personal goals. These are three different cohorts that are in action here. Each cohort develops their own image. And I'll just talk you through the left one. Uh, the one with the island in the ocean, that is Paradise Island, and that is their goal. That group wanted to save $3,000 total as a group. Every time they save $25 as a group, they get a beautiful looking sea creature that visits and helps them to enjoy themselves. And then that's a merman coming closer and closer to the island as they move forward. And um, you probably can't tell, but that's Idris Elba getting closer to the paradise. So as you can see we have a lot of creativity a lot of color this idea of group goals that the group is in each individual is invested in the group achieving success click again this is a way that you can see how we build our classrooms to encourage um, group uh, group dynamics and group cohesion uh, this uh, sorry it's a little blurry on the left hand side it's from a, sc a screenshot from a video but you can see that we set it up at small tables not in the classroom format you know sort of old school elementary school but geared for adult learning where people form together in terms of groups at a, at a table um, but there could be uh, 20 people in the room but they're all at a variety of tables we always make sure that things are well decorated that the group goals are up that there are flowers around that there can be music as people come in coffee and tea, et cetera. Click again. And this gives you an example. You can click forward. I'll give you an example. Um, fill out the slide. Yeah, there we go. That's enough clicking. So each person, when they come into the program, they're considered to be a member and they get a membership card. We don't call them clients or participants. They're members. In other words, member of the family, member of the network. Um, that's a picture of our, um, it, after an advisory board meeting, and you can see our advisory board is at work considering some of our results. We're constantly sharing our results, sharing some of our challenges and help, having them help us think things through. Um, it consists of about 20, uh, over 20 members and uh, we have quarterly meetings and then also subcommittees. One of our subcommittees is working on developing their own bank, which is very exciting. You can click forward just so that you can learn a little bit more how we do it. We have a rolling recruitment. If you can click forward, there you go. One more click. We're working right now. We started out um, at Drexel University. We got it going into the um, career link, in, uh, which is often referred to as an earn center. And you can see that those in the Building Wealth and Health Network did much better than those who are in regular TANF programming. Um, click forward. I'll just, we're, all, we're done with time, but if you could click forward a little bit, click again. We measure a number of different outcomes. Um, keep clicking all the way through as you can sense that people have experienced a lot of violence and adverse childhood experiences are quite high. If you can click forward again, 
thanks for clicking me through. I'm trying to get to the ending slides because <laughs> I'm at my 15 minute mark. Click forward, very high aces, click forward. Uh, click again. Those who had high aces um, did very well in terms of reducing depression and also improving employment. Click again. You'll see those who had very high aces or adverse childhood experiences had very good results in terms of improving their employment outcomes. Click again. Three times. There you go. We also have the members tell us what kinds of challenges they had at the beginning and how they feel towards the end. This will be posted up on the web and you can check it out. Click again one more time. There we are as a group. Ways you can get started. Make sure that your classrooms and your lobby areas promote social connection and peer support. Encourage lots of opportunities for sharing resources and providing financial incentives for any kind of group participation. Make sure that all of your staff can understand what the experience of trauma is and how trauma affects behavior. And of course, it's not essential, but promoting banking and saving money can really help you get a long way. Click again. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And these are some of our members. They also advocate with the state of Pennsylvania on how to improve the program, and it's from their own perspective. That's the power of peer support and social capital. So thank you very much for having me. I look forward to being in touch with all of you. Mariana, thank you so much for that wealth of information, and we appreciate you sharing that input. Uh, we're going to go into a second poll question now to get some additional feedback from all of you. That question is, how does your TANF program help participants build social capital? There are a few options for you to select. Uh, first is our TANF problem TANF program, excuse me, does not currently offer these opportunities. Second, we connect participants to mentors and or coaches. Third, we help participants build peer networks with other individuals participating in the TANF program. Fourth is we help participants build peer networks with other indiv individuals who may or may not be participants in the TANF program. So we'll give you a chance to weigh in on that particular poll. Uh, again, you can vote directly on the screen in front of you and we will share the responses shortly. Also, while you're voting, just to remind you that we are collecting all questions in the chat box for each speaker and we will disseminate those questions to the speakers during the Q&A session at the end of the presentations. Uh, you can direct a question to one speaker or all speakers, and we will make sure that it is forwarded to the appropriate parties. Let's see. So, uh, again, a fairly even distribution with the poll questions, um, primarily either not offering opportunities or connecting participants to mentors and coaches. So with that, we will move on into our second presentation with Erin. Good afternoon. My name is Erin Olikin, and I am the director of Vermont's Reach Up uh, TANF program, which is known as Reach Up. Um, thank you so much to the OFA and also to the presenters and for all of you for joining the webinar and um, learning with us together. I'm going to talk to you today about a small pilot project called PREP, Post-Secondary Readiness and Engagement Program, which provided a peer cohort model to introduce reach-up participants to college. We had three organizations involved um, in this project, which, is, um, which you'll see up on the screen, um, Community College of Vermont, CCV, NECA, which is the Northeast Kingdom Community Action Agency, and Reach Up, which is Vermont's TANF program. Next slide, please. So just a little bit of background information. You'll see uh, on the screen there a map of Vermont, and you see where St. John's Ferry is, which is located in the Northeast Kingdom. 
Community College of Vermont really strives to reach students who may not have considered college before. And the Northeast Kingdom is a particularly rural and remote part of Vermont. Vermont's child poverty rate overall is about 14%, but in the Northeast Kingdom, there are counties where the rate is between 21 and 27%. So it's really a much higher rate of poverty, um, much more remote and, um, and um, rural than the rest of the state. And it has um, a 12% higher rate of first generation students in this area of the state. And so, um, you know, connected to CCD, um, the commitment to really getting first um, generation students into college. And so we saw an opportunity for reach up participants to explore college as an option in this three way uh, partnership or collaboration. Um, NECA, the Northeast Kingdom Community Action Organization, is, is a kind of a hub in the community and is also a group work site for reach up participants. So we contract with NECA to provide uh, work experience. We have a, a wonderful job coach, Alexis, at NECA, and they also provide uh, transportation for us. And they also have child care available for preschool age children. So it was a natural place to recruit um, members for this uh, particular um, pilot. And um, the rural and remote nature of the Northeast Kingdom presented certain challenges um, that made us really kind of get together and think, how can we try to overcome some of these challenges, uh, the isolation, major transportation issues, um, social connectedness is much more difficult because it is remote because of the transportation issues. And so we wanted to think about ways that uh, we could promote college and social connectedness and a, and a peer cohort model for families and for participants in this area of the state. Next slide, please. So a basic overview of the program. Um, this is, as I mentioned, a collaboration between Northeast Kingdom Community Action, NECA, Community College of Vermont, CCV, and Reach Up, uh, which again is Vermont's TANF program. An anonymous donor funded two free college courses for a cohort specifically for reach up participants for up to 12. It was um, designed specifically for them um, to introduce them to college and to new opportunities that they may not have had access to in the past. And because it was a cohort model, the participants all learned together in the same class. They were able to make new connections and support each other as parents and as college students together. Next slide. So CCV provided the classes. The first course uh, was called Working in a Professional Environment. And this, was, this course itself was designed specifically for this cohort um, of students. This course entails career planning, workplace etiquette and communication, basic computer math um, and English skills. And um, because it was only for reach up participants, that gave them the opportunity to really be in a group who understood what they were going through, to be able to support each other with that knowledge of what it's like to be a parent and try to go to um, college and um, be li living on an extremely limited income and share those challenges and stresses together. The courses were free and they were three credits each. And they also, the students also had access to the CCV Learning Center, which provided them with tutoring and career planning. And there was a, a faculty coach and a peer mentor available and embedded in the class as well. There was also a second course available called Dimensions of Self and Society, and that took place after the first course um, was completed. And that class is CCV's flagship course and is designed to help students become lifelong learners. And that's a combination of traditional and online learning. Next slide, please. So NECA also provided a lot of support uh, for these families and these participants. 
and we're, they are able to provide the wraparound services that they needed in order for them to be successful. So they provided transportation if they needed it. They have a van that's able to pick people up and take folks places um, and get them to class. Um, they have childcare if the children were of, of that age. They could go to the childcare, um, which is also a head start. Um, they were able to help with homework, job coaching, encouragement and community, and really just um, as a hub in the community are able to provide that space and that support for students to be able to go and hang out together, to uh, study together, to um, receive support and help with homework, uh, things like that. There's also a food shelf there. There's access to counseling. Um, and like I said, just just space, which we think is important so that there's some place where folks can go and gather. Next slide, please. And reach up, um, our part in this was um, mainly to help support the students through case management, help them with setting their goals, um, provide support services. So we have support service dollars that were that are available that we're able to use uh, to provide incentives for finishing classes, for money to buy books or a laptop. Transportation costs, if somebody has their own car, we can help them fix it or provide gas vouchers or, um, or money to um, fill up their tank so they can get to where they need to go. Um, and the hours participating in the program counted towards the participants' work requirement. So we made sure to, to um, allow that to be something that was included in their goals so that um, so they could really focus on, on this as um, one of their main main goals. Next slide, please. So some of the testimonials from the group. Um, I was had the privilege of being able to attend the last day of the first class, and they had a celebration. And um, some of these, um, these actually came from some videos that were taken at the end. Um, but there was at the class um, what was really evident was just the incredible sense of camaraderie between the students it was pretty amazing to see they they were right there just kind of supporting each other and saying you know yeah you can do it and i can't wait for the next class to start um they talked about working together about making friends the benefit of going to college and the benefit also of taking this class with other people who are in the same situation so one of the main things that we noticed at the beginning was that there was a lot of anxiety around the idea of college. And you could see that from some of the comments. Um, there was a lot of um, just not knowing, um, not being sure that this was something for them. And I think that, you know, in in Shanna's program, I think that it has they have historically been so regulatory and um, compliance driven that we haven't really taken the time to step back and figure out what is it that participants want and what is it that they really need in order to move ahead. And this was a, a time for folks to be able to do this. And it was really empowering for people to be able to say, this is this is my goal and um, now I can do this. And so some of the things that we were hearing um, were things like these comments, I was very scared before. This gave me the extra motivation. It woke my brain up to new things. I learned how to be a better person and work as a team. Confidence is the biggest thing. This has helped me be more positive about the future. Learn what I need to do to take care of my family. There was really a strong sense of um, feeling good about being able to dream about the future feeling good about um, feeling more confident that thinking this wasn't something they could do, but now knowing that they could do this. Another thing that was mentioned was that folks felt a sense of respect that they didn't feel before. And so now they knew college professors, they knew college administrators. They were building these social connections that just kind of build upon themselves. 
and they talked about go um one particular gentleman talked about being out in the community and saying that he was a college student and the sense of pride that came with that and felt as though people looked at him differently um, when they knew that he was going to college. Next slide, please. So we have some modest outcomes. It was an extremely small project or, or um, pilot program. And so, um, so the quanti we don't have a lot of quantitative data, obviously, um, but some of the testimonials speak to the qualitative um, results of the program. But, there, but I do want to talk a little bit about what we did find and what, what happened as a result of the program in terms of outcomes. So nine out of the 12 original participants in the first, pro, uh, first class finished the first course, and they earned three, the three college credits. Um, and the reason why um, the three didn't complete the first course, they believe one moved out of state and the other two um, became employed. Three completed both courses, earning um, six credits. Two of those students went on to college full time and um, are participating in Vermont's post secondary education program, or PSD program. And that's a state funded program that supports parents through college um, with a grant that's uh, the same amount of money as a reach up grant or a TANF grant would be in Vermont. Um, but instead of having to meet a work requirement, they uh, go to college. Seven of them are now employed. So essentially, everybody is either employed or going to college full time. And of course, participants, as I mentioned earlier, participants increase their confidence, um, reduce their anxiety about college, and just new things in general. Um, felt that there were new possibilities, and it created a real sense of excitement and connection and ambition. So, as I mentioned, this is these are kind of some quantitative things, um, but just to, I think I, I always think it's important to think about the values that it it raises and the fact that it is valuable in and of itself for the dignity and worth um, and recognizing that everybody has something to something to contribute and everybody is worthy of having these opportunities in their life and um, the opportunity to increase social connection, um, to be able to think about the future and to dream about the future and have, have dreams and aim for those dreams. So some of the things that we learn from doing this and from looking at um, you know, what came out of this uh, original uh, initial project or pilot um, was possibly that we might need a second preparatory class similar to the first one before folks may be ready for a regular college course. Um, and then also that one having one class at a time really worked well for this class because, because of the level of the anxiety that they had going into it and because college was such a new concept for them, um, that it really worked well to have only one at a time so that they could really focus on that and ease into it. So we are now doing this a second, um, we're doing a second, in a second city now um, called Newport, which is also in the Northeast Kingdom, and that has just started. So we're excited to continue and continue to kind of tweak it as we go along and find out what works and provide this opportunity for our participants. Thank you very much. Thanks, Erin, for sharing the work that you're doing in Vermont and how you're building uh, peer networks to promote education and employment. Uh, really exciting stuff. Let's keep moving to our next poll question. Uh, for the group, what partners might you engage to help TANF participants create peer networks and build social capital? Uh, your options are none, educational institutions, other public sector agencies, 
private sector partners such as community-based organizations, faith-based organizations, philanthropic organizations, or other. So let's launch that poll and see how you respond. Feel free to vote directly on your screen. Uh, we've been getting some great questions in during the presentations. Continue to send those in through the chat box and we will cover them during the Q&A after the third and final presentation coming up shortly. Okay. It looks like private sector partners are the most popular, educational is high, public sector as well. Uh, so a good variety. Maybe you can share some of those others through the chat box as well. Now we'd like to turn it over to Christine Smith. Christine? Hello. Good Hi afternoon. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to the OFA for having me on the panel as well. Um, like Steve mentioned, my name is Christine Smith, and I will be sharing with you today from both my personal and professional experiences. Next slide. So during this webinar, we've heard about adverse childhood experiences and how that can impact individuals' ability to becoming self-sufficient. Uh, the slide about the iceberg, I feel like, is a perfect example of how important it is to understand context. And that's why I'll be talking a little bit about the term called historical trauma. Uh, it is not in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the DSM. However, it is a term that's widely used in reference to American Indian and African American communities, as well as Jewish. I just so happen to be all three of those races. <laughs> My mother is of African American and American Indian descent. Her mother is from Red Lake Nation and enrolled in White Earth Nation, a band of Ojibwe Indians up here in Minnesota. Although I don't have enough time today to cover history and policies that have directly impacted my family, I will share that my mother was a product of the Indian Child Removal Act and was taken from her mother and her community and placed in a home with non-native parents. And to put things in perspective, my mother has five aces and I have nine. Next slide. So I put this quote in because when I heard it, it was a transformative time for me. It was 2003 and I suddenly found myself a single parent of two children. I had a GED and retail experience. I was receiving benefits and living in subsidized housing, the Jeremiah program. I was going to college when I heard this quote from some literature that we were reading. And I had recently made the decision to leave my husband who was addicted to drugs and was emotionally and verbally abusive. I knew I wanted a different life, especially for my children. But at this moment, I understood why I chose the path I did and felt a sense of hope that I could change things for myself and my children. Next slide. So these are my two angels and please forgive their dirty t-shirts and open flies and look at their smiles. I had made a decision to move into the Jeremiah a supportive housing program so I could see those smiles. Next slide. While living in the Jeremiah program, working and going to school, I would receive letters from our TANF program. In Minnesota, we call it MFIP, which stands for the Minnesota Family Investment Program. And the letters would say in bold letters, your case is being closed. And below would say your food stamps, your childcare, and your cash will end by X date. Every time I got those letters, I would have anxiety attacks and call my mom and be bawling my eyes out trying to figure out what happened. I finally would call the county and they would tell me, oh, they received my paperwork and that those letters went out automatically. This happened numerous times. While I was living at the Jeremiah program, which requires school attendance, I had a counselor uh, for uh, MFIP counselor that refused an employment plan for me to go to college. After months of my compliance, she ended up transferring me to another agency. And I worked with that counselor who had herself had been on MFIP. She approved me going to school as long as I was working 25 hours a week as well. 
I knew I had to go to school to be able to support my children and having to work 25 hours a week, I was only able to go part-time. After 13 months, my case was audited by the state. My counselor was told that I had exceeded the time to attend school while I was on MFIP and I needed to find full-time work. Now, my counselor was another angel in my life. And although we would argue from time to time about my career path, she would always explain to me that the work about the work participation rate in the program. There's quite a bit that happened in between the time that I was on MFIP and later became a supervisor for the MFIP program at the American Indian OIC, and I won't go into that today. But while I was at the OIC as a supervisor, I was responsible for uh, organizing our job club. And because of my personal experience and background, things that I had done to get myself to a better place, I designed our job club in that way. So we had a very comprehensive, holistic job club. We talked about um, conflict resolution, empowerment, healthy eating, uh, interview preparation, historical trauma, financial health, etc. cetera. Um, most of our parents were from African-American, American Indian descent like myself, and I also shared with them that I was on MFIP. While I was at the OIC, I learned that I had a passion for policy and years later found myself working at the Minnesota Department of Human Services, also for the MFIP program. I was able to lead the implementation of our new education policy that allows parents to attend school full time until they graduate, as long as they're attending classes and studying 25 or 35 hours per week and are making sufficient progress towards completion. Next slide. So we're talking about the importance of peer support today and understanding ACEs. We also know the importance of protective factors such as community. Being a single parent and trying to get ahead when all the odds were stocked against me, um, all this, I was in all the statistics, it can be very daunting and even worse, lonely. I was blessed to meet fantastic women while at the Jeremiah, the staff and the residents that I'm still friends with today, over a decade later, and they are some of my best friends and mentors. Next slide. Unfortunately, as the slides said, ACEs are common. And I shared with you that my mother, myself, and children have ACEs, but I have not let that define me. It actually has given me the passion to do the work that I do today, training on ACEs throughout the state. Next slide. Again, we are here. Oh, did you go back one? Thank you. We're talking about peer support, um, which Peer support in itself is a protective factor, whether a person has ACEs or not, um, it's detrimental to a person's health not to have those protective factors in place. When I moved into the Jeremiah program, I had no friends and I had just lost my husband to drugs. And when I moved in, I literally cried for the first year out of gratitude because for me, it was the first time I had felt safe in my life. Um, everything started coming up. I didn't have to operate in survival mode and neither did my children. The staff themselves were mothers, um, some single, some not, but they were our village and we were each other's village. Next slide. All right, Minnesota data. Um, in Minnesota, American Indians and African American communities have some of the worst health, economic, out of home placements in the nation. We also have the highest ACEs of the state, as you can see. But having this information for me was empowering. I went through a the grieving period when I first learned about it, but you know, being able to have the, the data and the knowledge about ACEs and how it can impact you, it helped give me context around what I saw in my own family and community. It actually initiated a journey of deep self-discovery for me and mastery, and as a result has influenced the work I do today as well as my educational focus. I am passionate and committed to helping others understand how this impacts them, as well as their personal strengths and skills, and how to navigate systems. I also enjoy sharing with my colleagues and peers who are struggling with working with these with African American American Indian populations to have more tools to working with them effectively, both within their organizations and, and outside. Next chapter. Next slide. So today I am living a very different life than I was 15 years ago. My children are teenagers. I am remarried. I've owned a home and attained a master's degree. And I'm in the building phase of my life now that I have a solid foundation. I volunteer at the Jeremiah program teaching life skills and I work with a group called Mill City Kids to develop a prevention curriculum for parents of African American and or American Indian descent in our program who are at risk of entering child protection. 
uh, these classes would also count towards work participation. We are also working with systems to identify how they how they themselves perpetuate disparities for these communities as well, sometimes unknowingly. Next slide. That was my youngest daughter, by the way. <laughs> Um, as you probably noticed while I was telling my story, that my two older children also have some ACEs, four to be exact. However, they had something that I didn't. They had a parent who was stable most of the time, who loved and provided for them and led by example. In ACEs language, all of that's called protective factors. They have a sense of self-efficacy, they have healthy relationships with peers and with me, and they have a community. And in closing, I didn't get where I am today alone. I had many people in my corner cheering me on along the way, my children, my counselor, the staff and the women at the GMI program and many others who have become a part of my village along the way. Things that I thought were unattainable are now the norm. Thank you, I said. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. So we have a fourth poll question. This is more of a general question that you can enter your responses into the chat box. Uh, we wanted to know as a result of this webinar, what is one thing you will do to help TANF participants create peer networks and build social capital? So you can take some time to enter in your ideas into the chat box as well as additional questions that you may have for the presenters. Uh, we've collected questions during the presentations and we'll go into those uh, shortly. But certainly you can continue to add questions as we are discussing and we will get them out to the appropriate presenters uh, as soon as we complete the, the questions that have already been submitted. So if you don't mind, let's get started. We have some questions that have come in for each of the individual presenters and then a couple that I think would be relevant for all of you together. So let's start with sort of a general question for all participants and you can each weigh in as you see fit. Uh, and the first question was related to resources in terms of the capacity of some TANF programs that might not be able to build their own peer network initiatives. Have you identified any ways or uh, concepts to help TANF participants build social capital with limited resources? And I'll open that up to any of the three of you to to respond this is Aaron I can I can respond um, we think that in, in our case we're very fortunate that we have a great network of community providers who we work with and so we think really developing those relationships with um, community services um, community partners and um, you know the nonprofit world. There are a lot of there are a lot of resources out there, um, and sometimes it's just a way of figuring out what can we contribute, what can others contribute. Um, and I think we've all gotten creative in that way, so that um, sometimes we can provide the support. We may not have the monetary um, funds necessarily to start up a program but there are lots of folks out there with lots of great ideas and sometimes just coming together with those ideas, we're able to make things happen. Thanks, Erin. Uh, Mariana or Christine, any, anything to add? Sure, this is, this is Mariana. I think um, in a lot of ways, the, um, the beauty of, of the power of the group can emerge with not a lot of extra money and not a lot of resources. It's really about changing the mindset. So if you think about, well, I need to get more group experiences together, I need to figure this out. Part of what you can do is just rearrange your classrooms, rearrange your lobbies, make sure that there are places where people can sit together 
um, as a group at a table to create little places, even if there's an extra, like there's an empty corner, bring in a table from home, put four chairs around it and start to see what happens. Create opportunities during, if you're doing some like classes on resume building, maybe add, maybe not add, but take 15 minutes out of that time or 20 minutes out of that time and have the group share some experiences about what, what kinds of help they would might need and offer up an opportunity for other members in that group to share resources. And you'll find out that people start bringing things out of their purse. Oh, here's this little community forum, et cetera. Or here's a job fair at such and such. And if you have a photocopy machine right there, you can immediately copy those things and then pass them out into the group. You can create a bulletin board where people can do group announcements or you know, offer up some opportunities. So it's really opportunities for people to really connect and to share resources. And it doesn't really, again, it doesn't take a lot of money. It, it, it's a mindset in terms of the staff and the way that you organize your, your uh, classrooms and your, you know, your physical settings. And also just making sure that there are opportunities actually in each particular interaction for some kind of a group experience, even if they're coming in to just wait in line to get recertified, um, change the way that that waiting system is organized. Create opportunities for sharing. Great, thank you. Uh, let me see. The next question, we'll try to combine a couple. Uh, I think this was for you, Mariana, in terms of wondering how did you select the topics and develop your curriculum for the Building Health and Wealth Network? And also, what does curriculum or program structure look like around historical trauma? And we start with you, and, and if, if others want to jump in, they can do that as well. Oh, thank you so much for the um, the great question. When we got started, well, so I didn't talk a little bit about um, our experience at the Center for Hunger Free Communities. We've been doing research and active action and uh, advocacy around issues of food insecurity and housing insecurity and participatory action with um, low income families for um, for over a decade now. Um, and so we learned a lot about what was going on in TANF and also in people's lives that was being unaddressed by the systems that were meant to help people. So we were recognizing that there's no real uh, public assistance program that uh, works on issues of trauma and adversity. Um, and so we really wanted to find a trauma related curriculum, but make it relevant to people who um, were extremely poor and very disenfranchised and often sometimes disenfranchised by the very systems that are meant to help them. So we figured out a way to adapt this self curriculum that came from the sanctuary model um, for people who were on cash welfare and looked around um, at a variety of organizations who do asset building um, and tried to start to braid in Things like, you know, how to get your credit score and what does credit really mean? What are the emotional factors? We started to look at financial education and the emotional um, things that were starting to get dredged up for people as we were starting our program. We built those emotional reactions into um, helping us to develop our curriculum. So it's really uh, taking in from the sanctuary model, learning about what asset building types of programs around the country, which we recognized had no relevance to people who had zero to no income and who were very entrepreneurial. So we pretty much started to develop it as if sort of like a jazz tune. We had a melody, but we knew that there would be lots of improvisation once the group got into the room. So it's really over the course of a couple of years that we um, developed the 16 week curriculum. Um, and if you write to us and we can, we're happy to share the components of that curriculum. Um, as, the, uh, as the years have gone by, we've started to get more um, involved in the historical uh, trauma issues. We primarily focus on issues of, uh, issues of uh, child abuse and where that might be coming from in terms of um, African-American experiences of parenting. And we help people start to unpack some of that. And we recognize, rec having people recognize themselves and bring it up. So we're not 
we don't uh, have a teaching curriculum on that, but we talk, we get people to talk about their experiences of growing up, what their grandparents may have experienced, and then try to bring that into the forefront. And we also talk about how um, wealth, the systems of wealth in our country are completely um, sort of the historical violence of our wealth building systems. So we talk about how African-American women have maybe $5 in wealth compared to white women, which goes up to like 12,000 in wealth a year to white men or black men and then white men. And we kind of help put things into perspective. We're happy to share um, our curriculum. And then in the next four months, we'll have our, our whole curriculum very likely up and online for people to learn more about it. Um, one, well, sorry, one last thing is that it's, the, the, what happens is that the group itself helps to build that curriculum. We have the structure, but what the group brings is very creative. So it's not completely different every time. It's got the same melody, but the type of improvisation that happens around it is very creative and of course relevant to the group. Thanks, Mariana. Uh, Christine, the, the, the person asking the question asked if you could weigh in as well in terms of the structure and curriculum that could be developed around historical trauma. Absolutely. So it for me, it started with uh, my master's thesis um, and is, uh, like I mentioned in my presentation, a program uh, aimed at looking in our systems at parents that self-identify as African-American, American Indian, and also identify that they may have adverse childhood experiences. And so our, the curriculum that I designed that we're building out now with this Mill City Kids group is uh, going to be eight weeks long. And the model that I use actually came uh, from SAMHSA and there is a gathering of Native Americans, it's called GONA model. I actually went through the model myself um, and I feel like it could be adapted to, and specifically when I'm talking about historical trauma because I came from African American, American Indian communities. That's what our curriculum is designed for. Um, the, the GONA model, you can find it on SAMHSA. You just Google SAMHSA GONA model, G-O-N-A. And um, it's very inclusive, uh, kind of like what Mariana was saying, as far as it being creative and evolving, it's definitely provides a lot of opportunity for input and sharing, um, lots of team building and trust building um, among the group members. And there's a lot of physical activity. So it gets people um, engaged physically moving as well. So ours isn't complete yet. So I can't share anything as far as that, but you could follow our um, MC Minnesota, I'm sorry, it's Collective Action Lab, it's other Collection Action Lab. I can share the information with um, Steve and it can be given to those that are interested. Awesome, thank you. We'll definitely follow up with that. Uh, we have a couple questions for Aaron. Let's see, was prep geared more towards minor parents or children on TANF in hopes of cultivating self sufficiency with the second generation? Also, do you think prep could ever go statewide and how would you overcome barriers such as resource availability or? certain colleges not volunteering courses? PrEP was really geared towards um, the parents' ambition and parents um, creating opportunities for those parents. But, um, but where it, the children were considered was that um, what we find um, and I'm sure everyone can relate to this, is that everybody wants a better a better future for their children. And there's a real sense of pride when parents are going to college and sharing that with their kids, and they see their kids' pride in them when they're going to college. And so in that way, it did involve the kids, but it wasn't, um, we didn't have formal kind of parents and children learning side-by-side -side aspect to it. Um, and in terms of moving it statewide, we're kind of taking it one step at a time. So we, um, as I mentioned, we are going to try it in one additional um, town for now, and we're going to see how that goes, and then just hopefully gradually be able to uh, ramp it up as we go and as uh, 
and of course as we're able to figure out how to pay for it, pay for the courses, and make sure that we have um, the resources that are needed in any given area. Great, thank you. This is more of a general question, I think, for all of you, and sort of a common question that we often hear is, how do you deal with transportation and childcare obstacles in building out your various initiatives? So that's open to anyone who would like to respond. This is Erin. Um, so we had transportation built into the support service for the program. Um, the NECA, the Northeast Kingdom Community Action um, Program, has a van that they're able to use to transport people, and then we're able to also use support service dollars um, to help support people's individual transportation costs. Um, and I forget, what was the second part? Uh, child care obstacles. Oh, child care, right. Um, there also were, there is child care available at NECA for preschool age children. For much younger children, that's always been an obstacle, especially in our state, um, in terms of finding child care for very young children. So unfortunately, we didn't have anything to address that specifically and I'm not sure if it was an issue we do pay for child care but then there's the issue of finding it as well so in general that tends to be a pretty um, challenging thing that we deal with on a regular basis uh, and this is Mariana we too had uh, have our challenges in the state of Pennsylvania we made sure that um, everyone who was um, able to enter our program was uh, considered to be what they say in Pennsylvania as work mandatory and therefore eligible for a special allowance in terms of uh, transportation and childcare. Um, and that even though people are eligible to receive that, that support and actually um, get some of the state sponsored support for that, there's not one week that goes by where someone's um, special allowance or transportation dollars or childcare dollars actually don't get uh, posted to the uh, to the case. And uh, so we have a staff person who is, um, you know, on site when the uh, classes are going on to make sure that they can help to troubleshoot uh, with paperwork uh, challenges among the county assistance offices. So it's, a, it's an ongoing challenge, even though the state makes it available and pays for it. Um, I think that um, I think sometimes it's outdated paperwork or outdated expectations about uh, being able to have that paperwork and turn it in uh, can be a real challenge. And it's something that uh, it is our pipe dream to be able to provide child care um, on site. Still working on that one, though. Thank you so much. Uh, Christine, there was a question for you related to the job club you mentioned. Uh, what type of challenges did you face in starting the job club and how did you overcome them? Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, so <laughs> I was uh, balancing, managing a caseload of 75, supervising four staff, um, and also networking. Um, I made a lot of friends and uh, with different folks and said, hey, I'll come in and do some training for you if you'll come in and do some for me. Um, so I ended up just figuring out how to balance my time and uh, doing a lot of delegation um, really was truly boiled down to relationships. Um, I didn't pay any of the speakers that came in, but we had a week-long job club that was started at about 9 a.m. and ended at 2.30 and continued to grow because um, word, um, word through the grapevine to other people, you know, word of mouth travels. So with families, especially when you live in a smaller community and so people were, you know, the job club was growing and growing and um, I think it was just a win-win situation for the presenters as well because they had an opportunity to um, find more people for if they were 
you know, advertising a program or, um, you know, just wanted to tell them about the services they offered. And it ended up just being successful all around. Uh, when I left, we had up to 25 people attending the entire week, which if any of you know job clubs, that's like unheard of. <laughs> Absolutely. Great, thank you. Uh, Aaron, there was a question about your program. It's a great program. Uh, to what do you attribute the higher dropout rate from the first to the second course? Yeah, I think that um, I think it was partially not really feeling like the folks not feeling quite ready for that second course because the first course was more of a preparatory course, whereas the second course was the course that anyone entering Community College of Vermont would be taking, so any entering college student. Um, and so some of it was that, and that's where um, I think that we, we thought that it may be possibly having a second introductory course would be good between, um, between the first one and then the, the flagship course. Um, other things were, um, well, also um, seven of them got jobs. So that's also tricky because they're, um, you know, they're getting employed, which is a good thing. But we also um, want people to have the opportunity to go to college if they want to, you know, try to improve their employment prospects for the future. And that's a really hard balance um, for folks to think that far into the future with, with along with the time that needs to um, be devoted to college and um, living in, in poverty for four more years while going to college. And so I think I think there were a lot of factors. Um, but those are those are a couple of big ones that come to mind. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a general question, maybe two more, I think, general questions for all of you, uh, which would close us out unless anyone has some last minute questions. Um, I think the first question is related to TANF participants and wondering how you counter the perception of a peer net network activity as just another work activity requirement. Uh, how do you get past that and really communicate the value of participating in peer networks to the TANF participants that you work with? I can definitely respond to that. Um, yes. I think it was really important for them to see themselves reflected um, in it. And so we actually made like, it almost looked like a flyer, a party flyer to uh, let folks know about our job club. And um, you know, the folks that were working and going to school obviously weren't the people that were attending. It was the, the folks that were going into sanction and, um, so we put on there that we were having a culturally relevant, we actually, there's no Ojibwe word called Ogichida, which means peacemaker when we can, warriors when we must. And uh, we called our job club Ogichida. And so I think people felt like they were truly reflected in the job club. We took surveys afterwards um, just to find out, you know, what was relevant, what wasn't. And we had success. Yeah, I would I would echo that. This is Mariana. I think that people need to see themselves reflected and also in the attitudes of the of the people who are, you know, facilitating the peer network, the sense that the people who come in are valued, are members, are human beings, have emotions, and um certainly being able to um to share in each other's pain, I think is really uh, pretty essential and people when, when they would come in when we first started to recruit we were at the county assistance offices and they were given the choice of do you want to be in this network program where you can get a bank account and some financial counseling and then people would look over to our team and it was sort of friendly looking people with a lot of snacks and little fake flowers and a little boom box playing nice music and they said do you want to be over there or do you want to be in this program over here which was you know, show up to work on your resume for the umpteenth time. 
people naturally gravitated towards us. And what we hear, the feedback that we hear is that when they come into our offices and our place, they feel like they're treated with respect and treated um, as if they really matter. And it, once they get into the group setting, they start to develop friendships where they're much more um, attached to their peers and they feel accountable to their peers so that if they don't show up, they know that someone's going to be worrying about them, cares for them. Uh, and so there's this sense of group accountability and um, wanting to see your friends that be, that takes over um, the idea that someone has to show up. Fantastic. Yeah. Go ahead, Erin. Oh, um, I would definitely agree with what both Christine and, and Mariana said. And also, I think it's it's just important the way that case managers um, talk to, to um, participants about programs like this and so that it's framed in a way that this is an opportunity and this is something that could be really exciting versus here's a requirement, you know, here's something else you have to do to meet your work requirements. And kind of stepping back from some of that regulatory and compliance-based language that we're um, often so well-versed in and, and thinking more about um, the participants' um, and viewpoint and what is it that they would be interested in and having that kind of naturally come out of the conversation um, and then presenting it as an opportunity. Excellent. Thank you. And I think our, our final question is maybe not the flip side to the previous question, but I guess a supportive question or a similar question in that um, do you feel like the TANF, TANF program administrators understand the importance of facilitating peer networks and uh, by the same token, how would you communicate the importance to them from a program standpoint of beginning or maintaining these types of programs? Um, I'll jump in. Um, sure. Uh, this is Mariana with the Building Wealth and Health Network. It's taken us years to um, convince TANF administrators that this peer support thing would really work, but I think that at least in the state of Pennsylvania, there's a sense of frustration of recognizing that a lot of programs that they've tried to put in place have not worked well, and uh, it was the fact that we came to them with the idea and had them work with us to help to develop it so that they were in, engaged with it um, at the outset, and of course they didn't have to pay for it because I was able to get grant money to do it. Um, I think the other thing that um, has really helped us and I think has really turned the administrators towards our program to be more supportive and, and really start to invest in scaling us up, and now they're actually, they've started to kick in the money to do it, is making sure that they have opportunities to actually participate in the group, to come and observe a group experience happening so that they can see how things are happening on the ground and feel that connectedness. It's a certain kind of a magic that happens in the group. And as well as I showed you in our last slide, we had members to, from the Building Wealth and Health Network travel with us to the Capitol in Harrisburg to talk about the program. And I think that once administrators get an opportunity to talk to people who've been through the program and to see the, the light and the um, excitement in um, the experiences of the people who've been through it, that really helps because they like to feel and see those success stories and be able to have a sense of connection. This is that social bond, getting members of the programs in the peer support program to connect with administrators creates a social network that is very powerful and the administrators will start to really uh, pay attention to it and um, want to know more about it. I can just add to that too. Um, I really think it's important to, you know, we all have to do our um, our job clubs and, you know, so some job clubs, I've been to them myself where there's a computer lab and they tell you to go sit down in there and do job search for 25 hours. And, you know, it might take a little upfront investment, whether, you know, you're an organization or you're working with the county um, to start doing a more comprehensive job club, but it's totally worth it. 
um, we did a lot of like self assessments, career assessments, um, Myers Briggs, you know, that costs a little bit more money. Strengths Finder costs more money. They absolutely loved those, you know, and just doing those things and giving people the opportunity to um, do these activities together. I mean, you can find resources all over the internet for doing some different workshops and you'd be surprised how many people are willing to come in for an hour like you know, banks will come in for an hour and do some training. Um, you know, schools will come in, all types of folks will come in. So if you take a little time to just invest in it, even if it's two days a week, a few hours to just get started, um, I really think it can pay off in the long run and you won't even be thinking about your work participation rate anymore because people will be engaging. All right, thanks, Christine. Uh, I think that was the last question. So we will move forward to the closing. Uh, we always ask if there are topics that you'd like to see in future webinars, feel free to add that into the chat box. Uh, otherwise, I will turn it back over to James to close us out. James? Thanks, Steve. Yep, so as Steve mentioned, um, if to help us plan for future webinars that address your interests and needs, um, please let us know um, what topics you'd like to see um, in future webinars. Um, you can also help us expand our network and reach a greater number of people by directing interested colleagues from your local and state networks and agencies to our website, which is on the screen before you. And just another reminder, a transcript and audio recording of this webinar will be available shortly on the PRTA Network website. Um, we'd also like to hear from you about future webinar topics. Again, you can send it to the website before you. Um, and then finally, I'd like to thank again our presenters, Mariana, Christine, and Erin, um, for joining us for today's webinar. And also thanking all of you who who called in today. Thank you so much. Please remember to provide your feedback on this webinar. As it closes out, uh, it will pop up as soon as you close out. Um, the survey will show up for you so that you can respond to that. So once again, thanks to everyone, and you guys have enjoyed the remainder of your day. Thank you so much. <laughs>